you a warm welcome to Oxford Big Questions, APA, OBQ. Um, so I thought I'd very creatively start by giving you my Oxford stats, if that's okay with you. So uh, my name's Endia, I'm a first year geographer at St Hilda's and uh, the initials on my puffer say NAB. I mean, do with that information what you will. I've heard that Oxfest and Ox Love is a thing, but I don't know. So, um, if you haven't been to one of these before, don't worry because I haven't either. Um, but I do know what they're about. So let me give you a little lowdown on OBQs. So OBQs are a series of talks about tackling the big and sometimes slightly difficult questions regarding the Christian faith. And um, we, the idea is that we have a short talk and then it's followed by a Q&A. So that's what today is going to be. Um, can I get you to shift your attention to the slide? Right here. And um, do have a quick scan of that and then you can send in any questions that you have throughout the talk and then we'll address them at the end. And that's all from me, so I'm going to hand over to Neil. And thank you. Good. Okay, I'm going to put you here if that's okay. Um, so hi, I'm Neil. Um, really nice to meet you all. Um, so I must confess to a little bit of a thrill of fear coming up to the entrance of Oriel. Um, I did my doctoral confirmation viva just over the port of Lodge there. I was kind of still feeling the, the terror of that moment three years old. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so we're going to talk today about this question, um, where is God in a world full of pain? So I just want to get started here with um, a kind of personal story. On the 12th of March 1998, I was sitting at my desk in a design studio in Camden, in North London, where I worked, and my lungs collapsed. Um, I didn't know that that was even a thing. I'm not a particularly medical person. Some of you who are medities um, might know what that is. It's spontaneous new thorax. Um, I struggled home, probably should have gone straight to hospital, woke up the next morning feeling really bad. Um, blue light to hospital, accident, emergency, you know, the, 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 whole, the whole thing. It's never a good thing when you arrive at an A&E department and, um, you know, there are lots of people sitting around, and, you know, waiting with blood dripping out of their various different parts of their body and they rush you straight into the theatre. It's like, okay, I'm really in trouble here. Um, and it was a really frightening, you know, experience with <coughs> the medics swarming around and long needles and electrodes. Like, it just, it's not, not a situation that you ever imagine happening. Before all of that, um, I guess I kind of was maybe somewhat where a lot of you guys are or, or shortly further on in my journey. I was 24, um, graduated from Cambridge, did engineering. Um, i would always dreamed since I was a kid of being a designer um, and it happened. My dream came true. I was working in this cool little design studio, part of a, a firm that was based around the world, designing things for Apple and Nike and doing all kinds of cool stuff. Um, I had a visa in my passport ready to head off for uh, a year stint in Shanghai, everything was looking great, um, and then suddenly it stopped. Um, I wasn't fully well till I was 35. I went back to live with my parents, ended up so weak I couldn't cut my own food, couldn't climb the stairs. Um, and yeah, um, as the months and the years went by, you know, watching friends go on and you know, I guess I lived the life that I had really hoped to live and that I was thinking I was living, you know, progressing in their careers and getting married and all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, it just didn't look like it was ever going to happen. Um, for me, a um, long process of kind of trying to kickstart and cultivate recovery very slowly and then repeatedly crashing down back to the start point, you know, coming to a point, you know, really for a long, long time, which is just kind of living almost hour by hour, feeling very, very close to the edge you know, of kind of um, depression and, and all that kind of stuff. Why, why am I sharing this with you? I guess I just want to begin today by just kind of like showing my colours. I've, I've got personal interest in this question. Um, and um, we are going to spend some time now thinking hard about it. We're going to think maybe a bit technically, maybe a bit philosoph philosophically at points. Um, but I don't see that as an end in itself. Um, what we're talking about here is a visceral, practical reality. Um, it may already be a visceral, practical reality for you. Um, and if that's true, I'm really glad you're here. And I hope it's a minimum that you just feel, you know, some support and 
empathy in that situation, whatever it might be. Um, but the bottom line is that this is going to be a visceral, practical reality for every single person sitting in this room. Um, I never imagined that 18 months after graduating it was going to be for me, but it was. So let's get into this and start talking about this question, the, the title that we can set, where it's going in the world of pain. Um, I guess there are two quite different ways you can ask that question. So one is to come at it from a kind of agnostic, atheistic perspective. I'm, I'm kind of hoping quite a lot of people in this room are coming from that perspective. I certainly was. I don't come from a, from a Christian background. I, I was a Christian by the time the way of the wheels came off, but that was all just a development just before I came to university. Um, and so I think the question asked that way is suggesting, challenging the, the whole world of belief, isn't it? We're saying it's just, it, it's not, it just doesn't work. You know, if we live in a world full of pain, and we do, like, we can't really avoid that right now, can we? The assumption of the question is that it's impossible to combine that with believing in a God. If there is a God, that shouldn't be the case, that couldn't be the case, and therefore God doesn't exist QED. Another way to ask the question, though, is to come from a believing perspective, and I want to kind of acknowledge that this is a reality too. Um, if you believe in God, you can still cry out this cry that we're starting with. But now it's more an expression of kind of confusion and desperation, isn't it? Where is God in a world full of pain? That's the cry of the person who expected to find divine presence and they found divine absence. Who expected kind of nearness and encouragement and they found silence. And I, I want to just acknowledge that that is a reality too. Um, I'm not here today to try to persuade you that becoming a Christian or any other kind of theist is going to suddenly make suffering go away or make suffering make a whole load of sense. Suffering is a vast, irrational, horrific reality in our world. There might be reasons why God can still exist in such a world. There might actually be a necessity for God to exist in order to actually adequately explain the data of all of that suffering. But nonetheless, none of this is just going to make that suffering go away. It's not going to disappear. As we get started here, though, the thing that I want to stress, I guess, is that whichever one of those two ways you start, whichever point you're coming from, it depends on a common assumption for both angles. It assumes, doesn't it, that the God who is out there, the God who is named in our question, has got certain attributes. You know, if, if you came to this and the God that you were thinking of was one of the gods of ancient Greece and Rome, this question would actually make very little sense. Um, you know, there's no reason why Zeus suddenly had to stop existing just because there's pain and suffering in the world. Because the bottom line is, Zeus was pretty much indifferent to pain and suffering, much more interested in looking after himself and his own reputation within the pantheon than um, uh, being consistently careful over uh, the lives and the nuances of the lives of his day of, of devotees. And if good people got crushed, if bad, if bad people got rewarded, what does he care about that? There's no claim in that kind of world that the God you believe in is exclusively, consistently good. Um, and so as a result of that, um, you know, go ahead, believe it up. You know, it's totally compatible with a world full of suffering and stuff like that. So the problem is not just believing in God, is it? The problem is believing in a specific kind of God. Believing in a God who is good, and who has the capacity and the inclination to do something about what's wrong. That's where the issue crops up. And of course, the reason why we're discussing it here is that that's exactly the kind of God who's discussed in the pages of the Bible. See, the Bible presents us with a very un like God. A God who is not just powerful over the weather and to a degree over some of the other gods, but literally powerful over everything. He's made it all. That's the claim. Uh, not unreliable, not unpredictable, not indifferent to human needs. Not the sort of God who just winds it all up like a clock and then walks away and doesn't care what happens. The, the God the Bible describes is involved and does all of that involvement from a perspective of consistent, um, uh, serene goodness, you might say. Um, and yeah, that's really difficult, isn't it? That's what's introduced to us in the pages of the Bible. When God shows up and he introduces himself to Moses in the Old Testament, he says, he introduces himself this way, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. So that's why we meet the, pro meet the problem. How do you combine that with believing or realising that um, we live in a world of pain? 
In reality, though, I want to stress, look, whether or not you believe in that kind of God, you've still got problems with suffering, right? So it may be a slightly different kind of problem, but it's still a problem. This is something that really came home to me actually doing my, my doctoral project. So I worked in um, first century religious history and looking at the world of Asia Minor, one of the things that was really striking was just there are lots of people who believe in these gods that are formally incompatible with the, our question. You know, if you, their devotees knew that they weren't interested in consistently caring for their people. And yet, you still see this really striking sense of kind of injustice and abandonment when the wheels come off. There's a, an inscription in, um, a third century inscription from Northern Asia Minor that really captures this. It's a, it's a funerary text, it's inscribed on the tomb um, by parents who've lost their three children, all in kind of early to mid teenage years. We don't know exactly what happened to them. Um, and the monument captures this sense of kind of abandonment. It reads like this. It's just a, the, the final line. Here may be seen the thankless thank offering of their wretched parents. A libation on the tomb for their children who died before their wedding day. So you can just, you know, across the centuries, that's kind of, it's screaming to us, isn't it? The same thing that we experience now. And it's obviously true now, even though we have different religious convictions, isn't it? Every human being faces the horrific reality of suffering in the end. Every human being eventually asks, why me? Why now? Terrible things happen and we're left wrestling with it. If you come from a theistic perspective, if you're a Christian or a Muslim or Jew maybe, you might have that particular twist to it, how could God let this happen? But everybody's asking, how could it happen? It's just a different kind of question, isn't it? Let me prove that to you. So you might try and tackle this question of suffering by embracing it like an Eastern religious perspective, and there's a whole world of variety there. Um, but underneath that, one of the central strands of Eastern religious um, uh, kind of worldviews is, is this idea that suffering is connected to our embodiedness. So it's to do with being physical and being in a physical world. And so if you became a Buddhist, you would still have to face suffering, but you do it by embracing the reality that your physicality is the problem and that freedom is going to come from dissolution in the end, kind of escaping this cycle of birth and rebirth and kind of ultimately finding freedom in a kind of um, uh, almost a uh, unity with the void or something like that, nirvana. But that solution has obviously got problems of its own, hasn't it? The Buddhist makes the move here to find comfort in suffering and basically relegating the physical world to the realm of an illusion. But the problem with that is that everything physical gets relegated to the world of illusion, even the good things. So physical joys, physical interaction, interaction with people, favourite places, you know, I don't know, sunsets, holidays, paintings, children, partners, the whole lot is all relegated to the realm of illusion in order to achieve this solution. The cost of dealing with the badness in the world ends up naming everything as bad, naming the good things as bad as well. Obviously I'm talking in really broad brush terms here, you know, it'd be fun to get into some of these details, but just as a kind of basic sketch. So what about the secular atheistic alternative? Maybe that's the thing that's most popular here in Oxford that I am a table leader at the search. Come to the search on Monday nights, it's a great opportunity to talk about this kind of stuff. Um, and I hear this a lot, um, and have done over the years. Um, you know, suffering can be explained by the fact that we're just on this evolutionary journey. You know, and it's it's a shame that it happens, but it's just kind of like an unfortunate byproduct of progress. You know, it's miserable, but it's serving that higher purpose. You know, thousands and millions of unfortunate kind of lesser creatures have died in many horrible ways all over the centuries. But the result is that it's propelled humanity and all of our glory out onto the stage, and that's a good thing, right? Even within our own experience, we, we rationalise things this way. We say conflict stimulates creativity, right? There's some truth in the truism that war is the cradle of innovation, even though it's a pretty brutal reality as we're facing it right now. There's no pain, no gain. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You know, all of these things are finding the good in the bad. And I guess the problem with that as a philosophy is that you end up rescuing yourself from the bad things by saying all bad things are good. So that's kind of like the flip side of that Eastern vision, isn't it? And if you take that to its logical conclusion, we've got real problems, haven't we? Do we really feel comfortable saying Vladimir Putin's war crimes in Ukraine are good in the final analysis? that they're making humanity stronger 
more optimized for ultimate survival? Is that really an accurate account of what suffering really is? Could we say that we've done a good job of dealing with the data, if that was our philosophy? I can imagine someone in a philosophy class kind of rationalizing it that way, but I can't imagine it making much sense if their classroom and half their classmates were blown away by the Russian army. That wouldn't sound so smart, would it? So what I'm trying to do here is just highlight the fact that there's a massive explanatory gap between responses to suffering that eliminate God and suffering, just as much as there's problems with dealing with it from a theistic perspective. It's easy just to say, oh, here's the master reason why we want to believe in God. Well, you know, we need to ask ourselves whether this is problematic for our own worldview. I think it's problematic for every worldview. Believing in the kind of God the Bible describes undeniably raises really important problematic questions, and we're going to get into some of those things in a minute. But it does at least kind of acknowledge and affirm this fundamental human observation that good and evil are not the same in our experience, are they? Good things are worthy of celebration, worth striving to protect. Bad things are worthy of resistance, worthy of contempt. How do you deal with that? And a the theistic scheme at least gives you a way of doing that. So perhaps it might be a little bit too hasty just to kind of kick Christianity and the other big theistic faiths off the table on the basis of this question that we're asking. Maybe we need to give it a little bit more thought. And I would say Christianity has some surprising and sophisticated things to say into this space. And we can just look at a few of them. So the first thing, I guess, the question I would want to ask, and I've asked for myself, and now I guess I'm asking you, is just, are our goodness and suffering really incompatible? Um, here's a silly illustration of this. My wife, Ruth, and I took our son to hospital about a month ago because he, he was running around with his friends, fell over and split his lip really badly. And we took him down to the... the um, uh, the minor injuries clinic in Abingdon and um, ended up in the JR. And they basically said, look, there's a couple of things that we can do here. You know, we can stick some serous strips on this and it'll basically be all right. Um, but because he's cut right through, stitches are going to be the thing that's going to make sure that it doesn't scar and it doesn't end up all kind of weirdly misaligned. And so we thought about it. Um, they said, look, stitches are really going to hurt. Um, and we thought, okay, um, let's do the stitches. Um, and so, you know, we opted for the pain. Um, if we didn't care, maybe we'd have opted for the stereo. Thing. But because we love him, because we care about the future, um, we went for the pain. Now, of course, that example is only as good, as good as far as it goes, isn't it? That's an example where you can see a happy ending actually in your own experience. And so you can rationalize the bad on the basis of the good. Not everything is like that. So eight years ago, my dad died of cancer, um, and it was, horrid. It was fast, brutal. My mum has never got over it. Um, and frankly, I, I don't see much redemptive value in that. You know, my sister, my mum and me, I think, you know, we can't say we're better for what happened. You know, we've got a new sympathy, I think, for people going through that kind of experience, but none of that compensates for the loss of my dad. You know, it's a horrid experience. But I think, just trying to put these things together, I hope you can see at least you've got to ask the question that maybe the relationship between goodness and suffering is a bit more complicated than just the simplistic way with which we began. Not every experience of suffering has obvious redemptive value, but some do. Redemptive value is sometimes there if we choose to embrace it, or if we're enabled to embrace it somehow. That's, that's my experience of being sick. I felt like I ran out of resources of my own alarmingly quickly. You know, six weeks in, I was in a total mess, and the thing went on for years. But I did find, after all, that God met me there and strengthened and helped me. Um, and I look back on those years of illness now, and I am thankful. I really am. You know, it's funny. It's something you say, oh, I never choose, but I, I would not. I, I would not have the good that it's brought now. You know, I'm grateful, even though it was brutal, even though it was long, even though it was horrid. Um, that God led me through that, and I hope that somehow you know I'm, I'm living in the light of it and, and always will. So, what else can we say? Going back to the, the the comparison with Eastern spiritualities or with the modern kind of secular alternatives, I guess I want to also pick out like a particular area of sophistication in the Christian vision here. The thing that strikes me about Christianity is that it doesn't attempt to rationalise suffering. It doesn't attempt to kind of explain it. 
And you might say, oh, that's a weakness, not sophistication. But actually, when you look at this in the, in the biblical picture, the, um, the vision that we're given is that this is for purpose. This is, this is done deliberately. And there's, there's a reason for that. I think what's going on is that in the Bible, explainability itself is a good. Rationality itself in the Bible is a good. So what that means is that if we try to explain evil and suffering, we're actually giving it something that it doesn't deserve. We're dignifying it with something that belongs to God himself. And personally, I find that a really powerful idea. I don't think it actually helps much in the practical experience of the wheels coming off and wondering where in the world God is and what's happening. I don't think it's designed to help. I don't think philosophical arguments like that are designed to be pastoral particularly. But it does give real substance to our experience that what we're suffering is wrong when we suffer. See, the Bible's not trying to tell us that, that good is bad and bad is good. It's not trying to just wave it away. It acknowledges suffering as a mark of a world that's gone wrong, that's broken. And it's acknowledging that, I think, that suffering is the significant experience that we all actually experience it to be. It's not nothing. Suffering's not just another random production of a universe that could have thrown you good just as easily and cared just as little. It's a departure from the way that things are supposed to be. And the Bible says it's always noticed. Suffering sticks out like a sore thumb. And that's kind of, that's what you, you need to hear when you suffer. That it's noticed. I think the Bible also gives Christians astonishing permission to shout at God when things go wrong. Um, that might actually be one of the best kept secrets of Christianity, so let's get it out there. If you went and read the Psalms, you would be surprised to find how much shouting at God is going on, how much expression of confusion and anger there is sometimes. You might have thought Christians would be discouraged from doing that kind of thing, right? Highlighting this clash between the good God they believe in and the bad things they experience, but nothing could be further from the truth. Christians are positively invited to bring their experience of suffering to God exactly as it is. And I think that, um, yeah, that, that's a really powerful observation. I have a Muslim friend who I met at the church years and years ago and we stayed in touch um, and talked often about this kind of stuff. And it's striking that in his journey of faith, this is one of the problems. You know, he comes to those same points, um, you know, where he wants to challenge God, where he wants to accuse God where he wants to shake his fist at God, but he doesn't actually have permission to do that. In his community, that's, that would be considered irreverent. And weirdly, I think that also affects secular culture too. You might think this is a strange observation. I think it's, it's here in secular culture, not so much because it's irreverent to say that, but because it's irrelevant to say that. Why shout at a God who isn't there? I can't help wondering whether that isn't part of like the... Men we, li we live in times of mental health crisis, don't we, if you look at the numbers. You know, our incredibly advanced post-spiritual world is in a mess in this area. And I wonder whether this is part of it. How are we supposed to cope with suffering if there isn't some kind of higher authority to wrestle with, to shake our fists at, and say, where are you? Christianity may not give us access to some kind of master big picture that explains it all. But that's not the, thing, the same thing as being asked to believe that there is no big picture. Christianity at least gives us the permission to be real about suffering. Secularism, I'm afraid, is ultimately going to ask you to swallow your sufferings whole and act like nothing happened. Nobody can do that. But the Bible goes even further than that. The Bible argues that however inexplicable suffering might be, God himself has experienced it. And this is totally weird, isn't it? It should be. I wonder whether we're actually not very well placed to spot the weirdness of this. Tom Holland does a great job of, of, of kind of explaining this in his book, Dominion, if you, if you haven't read it, it's a great read. Um, he basically argues that even in our post-Christian culture, we still have these kind of massive assumptions about what makes good good that comes from our Christian heritage. And this is one of them, the idea that a good God is the kind of God who's a shepherd, a God who is a servant, a God who lays down his life and his followers, you know, that's totally bonkers in, in the world in which it emerged. In the ancient world, nobody thought a leader who was humiliated and suffered was the kind of leader that you wanted. And the further up the tree you go from kind of human leaders up into the, you know, the divine realm, the less logical that becomes. When early Christians went out claiming that the God who made the universe had become a man and died, 
People thought they were out of their minds. It didn't seem like a good idea. But that's the picture of God that Christians are given. We might not have answers. We might not have any kind of obvious pathways to redemption out of our sorrows. But we do have this. That when the wheels come off, when we're abused, when we're mistreated, when our bodies break, when our loved ones die, Jesus has walked that path ahead of us. And in some strange way, the Bible says we share in his suffering, there's fellowship there for us at that moment where actually often what we experience is supreme loneliness. The Bible's trying to say to us, you're never actually alone in that moment. That's a beautiful thing to know. That might sound like wishful thinking, but actually, can I just tell you from personal experience, that is the difference between survival and collapse, between life and death, actually, when it comes. And millions of people around, around the world have experienced that same thing that I'm testifying to. Christianity makes no promise that suffering is going to be avoided in this life, makes no promise that when it comes it's going to be short, makes no promise that when it happens it's going to lead to obvious benefit, but it does promise you'll never be alone. That's really, really vital. But as I conclude, I want to go back to the question that we started with and just push just a little bit harder at the underlying presupposition. So far we've looked at this thing, where is God in a world full of pain? We've thought a lot about what does that presuppose about God? It tells us, you know, it's presupposing that there's a good God out there, there's a powerful God out there. But I want to just ask, what does the question presuppose about us? I think this is actually a really vital step that we need to make. You see, this question presupposes, doesn't it, that suffering is not the norm in human experience. It's, it, it presents it as a kind of alien intruder in some sort of way. It, it presupposes that there is a difference between bad things and good things and that we can long legitimately for the good things to be restored. All of that is relative, of course, like the good times that we're longing to see restored um, are pretty unique here in our kind of modern Western culture, aren't they? And they don't make necessarily much sense to someone living in a less privileged environment to us. Actually, the kind of suffering that we would love to see removed is actually probably, you know, might be a good in the mind of many people living in many other cultures. Might be an unattainable good, you know. Our vision of suffering, I don't know, is what, you know, what does it look like when the wheels come off? Like sometimes it's really bad, but sometimes you know, it's fairly trivial on that global scale, and it's good to remember that. But the point I want to make is that wherever we live, when we rage against suffering, we can imagine something better, can't we? And it's worth just stopping to ask ourselves, why? Why is that? In the Bible, in the book of Job, there's a passage that gives what initially seems to be a pretty disturbing answer to this question. It's in Job 34. And it goes like this, if it were God's intention and he withdrew his spirit and his breath, all humanity would perish together and mankind would return to the dust. The implication is that whatever normal life looks like to us, whatever norm we use as our kind of, you know, our benchmark for determining when, when good things have just happened in our life or, or when something bad has happened, when something that we've grown used to has been removed, whatever that norm is, the Bible's trying to say to us, it's not yours by right. It's a consequence, always, of the action of God. It's a work of his spirit, according to that verse. And if he withdrew it, if he withdrew his spirit, it would cease to be. That norm and everything with it would cease instantaneously to exist. The Bible doesn't accept the idea that we deserve the lives that we live. It actually tells us really directly, repeatedly, that we don't. It argues that life is a gift. It argues that just drawing breath in this miraculous world, this kind of fragile jewel spinning around in the void of space, that that is an amazing privilege. And I, I want to just think about that for a minute here as we close. I have no particular opinion about whether there's life on other planets. I kind of hope there is. Um, but I, what I think we can say with certainty is that if we had to find it, we would have to travel an astonishingly long way. Right? The nearest exoplanet currently known to science is called Proxima Centauri B. And it is sadly almost certainly uninhabitable um, because its solar year is 11 days. So you can imagine how close it is to this big star it's going on. It's a bit like Mercury, so you wouldn't want to live there. But even if Proxima Centauri B were somewhere where life were going to exist and we were going to go uh, looking there, it's four light years away from where we are right now. That's 23.5 trillion miles 
So just to put that in perspective, the Voyager space probe is, the, is currently the, the, the man-made object which is furthest away from the Earth. It was launched in 1977, and since then it's travelled 14.5 billion miles. That seems like a really long way until you put it in, in, in the context of our nearest exoplanet. To reach Proxima Centauri b, Voyager would have to travel on for another 73,000 years. That's the nearest exoplanet. And that provides a glimpse, doesn't it, of how special our experience is right here. If we ever made it to Proxima Centauri b, and if we did find any signs of life, even an enzyme or something, it would be the discovery of discoveries, wouldn't it? It would be the crowning achievement of human culture. But that realisation, I think, forces us to turn the telescope round and look back from there to here. And just think that this world we live in, it's an astonishing place, isn't it? Just think about what's going on around you. Think how stable it is. Think how long these buildings have been here. Look at your body. Just think what you can do. It's not just that this is an amazing place. We ourselves are the most amazing thing in it, aren't we? Experiencing this environment, breathing this air, being able to reflect on it all, explore it, and you know, turn it into music and poetry and science. It's just um, it's, it's mind-boggling, isn't it? None of us made that happen, and the Bible wants us to ponder that, and ponder it, I think, especially in the light of our response. The Bible looks at our track record as stewards of this planet and finds us wanting. And we can hardly disagree, can we? Look at the damage that we're doing. If, we, if there really was a God behind all of this, I hope none of us would actively want to meet him and try and explain all that. Like, would we like to you know, try and give an account for the way that we handle this incredible jewel-like gift that we've been given? If God did withdraw his spirit and breath and pull the plug on this astonishing place, if the world stopped bouncing back from all of our acts of vandalism, could we complain? The Bible tells us that God cares when we suffer, but it also wants us to think, to, for us to think carefully about how we ask the question here. That question that comes most naturally to us, why me, why now? That's a really important question, and in my experience is God will always meet us there when we ask it. But actually it doesn't change the fact that a better question is not why me and why now, why not everyone? Why not everywhere? And depressing though that sounds, that actually gives, I think, an incredible new perspective on suffering when it happens. If you believe that you deserve the good life that you have right now, can I gently warn you that you're submitting yourself bit by bit to slavery? If things continue to go well for you, every little increment of blessing you get will give you a higher and higher estimate of what you think normal should be. So it's more and more fragile, isn't it? Before you got to Oxford, I imagine that you were sitting there anxiously waiting for the email. You know, the one that says the yes or no email. You better believe many more people than who got the yes email got the no one. What a blessing, what an upgrade it would be if that happened right. Can you, can you picture yourself still in that situation? But once you got it, how long did that news take to become normal? A day? An hour? If someone had come along and taken it away from you after a week, how would you have reacted? You would suddenly have started behaving like that was a right, wouldn't you? There's a problem, isn't there, with this whole kind of gradually step and this ratcheting up of our expectation of what normal view really is. You see, the problem is that inevitably those reverses will come. All of us will suffer. Life can't and won't continue to be a long string of happy endings. Whatever Disney taught us as we were growing up, that's not how it's going to be. If we allow ourselves to believe that we deserve it, we will end up entitled and bitter, enslaved to our sense of what God or fate or society owes us. But if you're a Christian, a Christian who knows that even the basics of life have come to you as gifts, then when the wheels come off, when you don't get your grades, when you miss the job that you dreamed of, when you split up with the dream girl or dream guy, when your health collapses, when you lose a loved one, you can say, I am now blessed less than I was. And that means something. That's authentic. You can actually go there with God. You can shout at him. You can experience that. It really has something because that's exactly what it is. But at the same time as saying, I am blessed less than I was, 
you can also say, but I am still blessed. That's freedom. When I found myself unable to work, unable to walk, watching friends go on and live the life that I had hoped to live, faith in a good and powerful God didn't make things worse, it made them better. I realised that even though I had lost good things, I was still massively privileged. Faith in God freed me from a worldview, and I think sadly this is kind of the worldview that's implicitly out there, that life was really only valuable when things were going well. You know, when I had the goals that I had attained, life was somehow, on, somehow kind of on hold when that didn't happen. And I think faith in God then holds more hope for us, frankly, than that secular vision that seems so obvious to us here when everything is going well, maybe, but which I think can only offer us torture when those blessings are gone. That's what I've got. Um, I'm really happy to take questions. Sorry, that's how we're doing for time. A little bit longer.